Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the next in our series of inaugural lectures for our new professorial staff. Um, Ed is uh, not such a new member of our professoriate, actually. He's been a professor for some time, but as many of you will know, we're catching up uh, through that period during COVID when we weren't able to do the inaugural lecture. So we've uh, had a, a bumper time uh, uh, in the past few months and actually going forward for the Faculty of Natural Sciences, welcoming our new chairs uh, in. Uh, just a little bit of background uh, about uh, Ed before we start. First of all, just say thank you for coming. It's great to see um, uh, audience of colleagues here at Keel, uh, friends and also uh, family of Ed's here. Ed told me he wasn't nervous until his mother suggested he ought to be nervous. Um, so he's now suitably nervous, as most people are when they give their inaugural lectures. Uh, so welcome uh, to all friends and family. Uh, Ed has researched and taught in the area of online human behaviour for over 20 years, and he looks into the design and usability of an impact of digital products, as well as the use of the information that they collect. Uh, he's worked uh, at Keele twice, actually, as a teaching fellow from 2005 to 2009, he was doing his part-time PhD at then, um, and then since 2014 in the School of Computer Science and Mathematics as a lecturer and then senior lecturer, holding the roles of undergraduate and postgraduate program di director and also, importantly, director of education for the school. So during uh, Ed's career, he's not just been involved in education, but also, importantly, in research. He's brought in over two million pounds of funding from a variety of agents, um, and he's published over 100 publications and spoke at a wide variety of venues, uh, mainly in the area of e-health, human-computer interaction, learning analytics, and social media analysis. And I know that Ed's got a particular interest in artificial intelligence, and I hope he's going to calm my nerves after listening to the news article driving into work this morning about how AI is going to soon be taking over the world and doing all sorts of things to us. So hopefully he'll give us some word of reassurance, or otherwise at least tonight. Um, but I know that's a bigger area of interest of Ed's. Ed has also established a very important profile in education, which is recognised through the Senior Fellowship of the HEA and over 20 publications, specifically in education journals and conferences. Um, previous to Keele, he worked as a principal lecturer at the University of Greenwich and as a researcher at City University London. I think some really important things for me that Ed has brought to the uh, faculty during his time here um, He's designed and launched ambassador schemes, uh, mo uh, modules at Keele where students, around uh, over 50 so far, volunteer with local organisations such as schools or colleges in order to apply their subject and act as enthusiastic uh, role models, so really important role in outreach. Um, during COVID, he, involved in, he was involved in a very, very large scale portfolio development for us as we expanded the portfolio of taught programmes um, uh, in our degrees, both undergraduate and postgraduate degrees, and that all happened during the COVID times. I know he worked incredibly hard under enormous pressure in very, very difficult uh, times there. And he's also, importantly, um, uh, helped um, um, provide a lot of support and chair for the uh, British Computer S Society uh, Human Computer Interactions 2022 conference, which was held at Keele last year. So I'm very excited to listen to what Ed has got to say about the interactions of the digital world, humans and computers this evening. So uh, without further ado, welcome Professor Ed De Quincey to give his inaugural lecture. Thank you all for, for coming. Can everybody hear me? Great, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so, just to explain, the music outside um, was my dream lecturer walk on music. I'm not arrogant enough to get them to play that as I walked up here, but that was what was going on uh, out there. And during, during the pandemic, I'd sort of put five-second short clips of different songs that I liked on the videos that I spent 14 hours every Thursday making, uh, one to entertain myself and also to try and get the students to appreciate uh, my musical taste of the 90s and noughties. Uh, so that's what you were um, enduring outside. Um, what I'm going to... It's 
because it ha happened to a computer scientist. Um, so yes, yeah, so the, the title of this is sort of quite strange. I was in a strange mood when I came up with this, and it's sort of a, a pun on a Stanley Kubrick film. Uh, but what I want to focus on uh, and leave you with a message relates to the thing on, on the right-hand side there, how I learned to stop worrying and love the user. A few years ago, I gave myself this bizarre title, um, which I've kind of stuck with now. Um, during my career, um, this is a bad time to say this, but it wasn't planned. Uh, I don't think many academics' careers are planned. Um, but I basically really tried to follow what I was interested in. Because if you're interested in something, hopefully you'll be good at it as well. So I've really tried to do that. Um, I've had a lot of luck. Anybody that stands here has had a lot of luck. And I've said yes to a lot of things. Um, now, what that has meant is that I've ended up having sort of several streams of research and teaching that I'm involved with. Uh, and it's taken me a while to sort of coalesce that into a story. Um, so I gave myself this title, Online Human Behaviorist. And picking up on the, uh, the AI thing that uh, Jonathan was mentioning, I thought I'd let AI try and represent what an online human behaviorist is to save me the job of doing that. And he came up with this. Uh, so this is using something called DALI, which is integrated into Bing now. Typed in, online human behaviorist, giving a lecture. And this was the first thing it came up with. <laughs> kind of looks like somebody that runs Vision Express, um, <laughs> holding a brain in front of a computer. And when that came out, I was thinking, well, that's kind of me. Maybe I can sort of adapt that, make it look a bit more like me. Uh, and then that will set the start of this talk. So I added the words brown beard uh, and sticky up hair. Um, and what it produced was this, which is someone that seems to be just incredibly angry and confused at the same time, which is a bit more <laughs> like me. Um, but I didn't think that was the best image potentially that represents this thing called online human behaviorist. Uh, so I went for something that's more abstract. If you add the word pixel art in, it comes up with this sort of abstract thing of a half yellow, half blue person with a sort of a bleeding red brain at the top. Um, but the good thing is that AI can't do that yet, uh, and I'm still required to explain what that is. So we're not, we've got a couple more months, Jonathan, uh, of working. So there are two strands to this. Uh, what I'm interested in is looking into the design, usability, and impact of digital products, working with people to design those, and that's the important part. And the other side of that is, once you develop these products, they are collecting lots and lots of data, lots and lots of content. And what can you then do with that? What can you infer about their behavior that's going on then in the real world? This side, um, this is stuff that I've been doing for about 15 years, and predominantly it relates to, to Twitter. Um, unfortunately, uh, I haven't got time uh, to talk about that side, so I've decided to focus on the left-hand side. So the next bit is, this is the bit that, this is what you could have won. Uh, this is a different talk. But it was important for me to actually uh, to highlight this, purely because one, Liz Poole, uh, my collaborator, is here, and I've thoroughly enjoyed working with her for, I think, it's six, seven years now we've been working on this uh, together. Um, and it's an incredibly depressing topic, what we're looking at at the moment. It's anti-Muslim sentiment online. So we're dealing with after terrorist attacks. Um, so there's some horrific stuff, uh, of course, in, in that, and it's kind of solved, destroying, but working with Liz and Eva has actually been life-affirming during that time. So I'd like to thank, thank her. Um, so this is just a quick chart. We, we were funded by the British Academy to look into uh, this hashtag. So tweets that were posted after the Brussels bombings in 2016 that contain this hashtag, Stop Islam. This huge increase in tweets. And then, of course, it dies down after that event has happened. And what we were interested in is the networks that were formed. So on the left-hand side there, you've got uh, sort of an anti-Muslim posting network that's highly organized, sort of right-wing posters. Um, geographically, it just so happens that that's predominantly in the United States. Um, on the right-hand side, actually in Europe, uh, something that's far less organized, but just a counter-narrative forms where people then are uh, trying to sort of defend Muslims, uh, post pro-Muslim sentiment. And we're interested in the dynamics there between those two groups and any interactions that happen. Um, and what we've been doing for the past three, four years now, uh, funded by the HRC, is to look at similar sorts of things, but after Brexit, uh, after the Christchurch terror attack, and then during COVID as well. 
If you are interested in that, I'm more than happy to talk to you about that afterwards. Uh, but actually, we also have an event in June. There will be a report out and hopefully a book um, as well on that topic. So I just wanted to, to highlight that because it is a big part of my work, but I wanted to focus on the other part uh, today. So it's this, this idea of looking into the design, usability, and impact of digital products. And it kind of relates to this. I'm just constantly annoyed. Um, has anybody experienced this machine? It's in this building. So in the, over there, there's this self-service um, sort of sandwich shop. Um, the self-service part's really good. So you pick up your items and you scan your own stuff. Um, then what happens is you're greeted with this message. And it confuses me every single time. So it says, thank you. Please take your items. So I'm ready to take my items. But then it gives me two options. Print receipt, which I don't want to do, or no. Immediately, in my mind, I'm going, but I do want to take my items. <laughs> and you've all had that feeling. You've all had that, that feeling where an interface, an interaction that you've had with a computer or an app or a game or something has made you feel uneasy. And immediately, it makes you feel stupid. Yeah, everybody has had that. And you go, oh, it's me. I'm the stupid user. Why can't I use this? I must be stupid. You are not stupid. There is no such thing as user error. That is just poor design. That is the designer not thinking about the person that's actually going to be interacting with that multiple times during the week. OK? So that's kind of a lot of my research is driven by anger at those kinds of things. Um, and it's been around for a long time, this concept. This concept that what we need to be doing is designing the things that we make based on the needs of the user, putting the user at the center of any developments that we actually create. Um, and a lot of my work and teaching as well, uh, as well as research, relates to this, this idea of a user-centered design process. And it doesn't really matter what this thing is. It's just a load of methods to help you work with people, your target audience of a website, of an app, of a game, of a piece of software. So first of all, we can identify who they are, identify their strengths and weaknesses, um, and importantly, identify what they want, and then work with them. So iteratively produce the product, and at the end of the day, because you've involved them, it will be a better product at the end, and you'll get around those annoyances, the example that I just showed you. Um, and this is where, when I was creating this, is, where's Gordon? So Gordon Rugg back there is my PhD supervisor, and I had him nagging in my brain. And he, I had, had him saying, tell them about how bad questionnaires and interviews are. Uh, so this is that part, Gordon. So the default that people use when they think, well, I've got to go and find out something about people, about a user, is they go, I know. Questionnaires and interviews the way forward. If you send out a questionnaire to 100 people, they'll all tell you the truth. They'll all respond immediately. Or if you interview somebody, you ask them a direct question, they'll give you a direct answer. Of course, that doesn't happen. And they've been shown, and Gordon has shown this and others, they've been shown to miss important types of knowledge, important types of information. The perfect example is this. It's something called tacit knowledge. Um, how many people drive here? So. Good. So you've all had that feeling. I have this feeling, say, every time I come to campus, maybe sort of one in five. So we live just outside of Newport. I get in the car. Um, I hit a village called Woodseaves. Anybody know Woodseaves? Woodseaves has three average speed cameras. And then I get to Eccleshaw at the other end. Now, quite often what happens is I remember to slow down during Woodseaves. I note each of those three. I check my miles per hour, uh, and I'm within that speed limit. One out of five, what happens is that I end up in Eccleshaw having no memory how I got there. Now, that's not because I've been drugged or anything. That's because I'm a good driver. I've been driving now for 30 plus years. No, not that long. <laughs> Under 30 years, 25 years. But still, I am now an expert driver. And it's become a compiled skill. And no matter how many times that you ask me how I drive, I have no idea anymore. That's why it's really difficult uh, for people to actually teach driving because it's really difficult to unpack that skill. So if you ask somebody in an interview, well, how did you drive between uh, Newport and Eccleshall? I probably wouldn't know. I wouldn't be able to tell you that. So that's why questionnaires and interviews aren't the best method for certain types of knowledge. That's not to say that they aren't good when used appropriately. So what I'm going to do um, is to cover 
give you a very brief overview of three studies that try and sort of show, show this and different lessons that I've learned about human-centered design or user-centered design. So this is actually the first bit of research that I ever did. So I did my, my PhD here at Keele part-time, started in 2003, finished in 2010. Um, and it was based all around one method, um, and that's called card sorting. Now, what card sorting is really good at is sort of eliciting from people what's called information architecture. But the easy way of describing that is, well, where does stuff go? So, uh, for example, on Amazon, every single product fits into a category, a subcategory, a sub-subcategory, a sub-sub-subcategory, and so on. And that's how Amazon then build this navigation that they have on the left-hand side. So products usually fall under one of these high-level categories. On the BBC News website, again, every single article fits into a higher-level category, then a subcategory, a sub-subcategory, and so on. And all this is there for is to enable us as the user to be able to find the thing that we actually want to read or buy or whatever. And a really simple example is films. Films fall under a genre, a subgenre, and so on. So this is actually how we interact predominantly online, this idea that somebody has created an information architecture, a navigation system, to help us find the things that we are actually looking for. And card sorting is a really good method to enable you to do that. So one of these user-centered methods. So if I was interested in trying to determine uh, the information architecture of an e-commerce website that sold mobile phones, so Amazon does that, and I'm trying to find out, well, what are the attributes of a mobile phone that people are actually interested in, I'd use something like card sorting. And I've done this with students, and it's great to see their faces when I take their mobile phones off them, because uh, they have no idea what I'm going to do with them next. What you do with your user, you give them, could be pictures of mobile phones, but it's far better if you use actual physical objects. Give somebody a set of mobile phones, and you ask them to sort them into a category based on a particular criterion. So it could be, the first thing they pick is color. And they go, oh, these are black, these are white, and these are other. Okay? You then reset them. And you say, right, can you pick another criterion? And they may go, well, the make. So they go, well, these ones are Samsung, these ones are Apple, these ones are Sony, etc." You ask them to do it again. And then they go, oh, the price. So oh, these ones are expensive, these are medium, these are cheap. Okay? And what that is actually doing, and if you do that with enough people, you'll find an overlap then with how they actually want to sort these objects. What you're getting is, over there on the left-hand side as you're looking at it, is you've got this, this sort of filter search that Amazon has. So you can then start to filter how you actually want to find the mobile phone that you're interested in based on the attributes of the phone that you are interested in. So that's what card sorting is, is good for. Um, the first study that I did, instead of giving people mobile phones, what I gave them was screenshots of home pages for MSc courses around the UK. Because we're kind of interested, well, what, uh, what are students and web designers interested in when they look at them? So what are the attributes of an MSc homepage that a student is actually interested in? And this is the first time this has really sort of shaped my career, or this strand of my career, in effect, because this was the result. Um, students, the things that they were trying to sort by, the attributes of the web pages that they were interested in, were far more about the content. And it makes sense, doesn't it? A student is interested in the content of an MSc course that they are interested in. So it's things like the qualifications, uh, the use of acronyms, uh, whether they want to go on the course or not, information about qualifications, departmental information. So all the stuff, really, that a student is interested in, that kind of makes sense, doesn't it, that they pick. Web designers, of course, they're far more interested in the form, the design. So they were trying to sort by where the navigation was positioned on each page, uh, whether it was resizable, where the logo was, whether it is user-friendly. And you've got two contrasting views there. You may go, well, that's really, really obvious, because, of course, designers are interested in what it looks like, and, of course, students are interested in the contents of the course. The twist is that we asked the web designers to do it from the student perspective. And it was just that they were unable to do that. They just couldn't get past the fact that they were interested in design stuff. And that's the first time I realized 
there is this huge disconnect, and that's why stuff doesn't work, because designers don't know what users want. Okay? So this is why now I've realized loving the user is important. So I moved on then to look um, at a huge problem, music. So everybody tries to categorize music by genre and subgenre. Um, so what I produced was an online tool. Uh, so the first, the MSC homepage thing, that was actually me printing out screenshots and laminating them. Uh, this was an online tool that I produced where on the left-hand side there, those were the cards, so actually they were songs. People could double-click on the song title and it would play a 30-second clip. They could then create folders, um, basically piles, and then sort these songs into these piles, again, based on a particular criterion. And what did I find? Everybody, so we got 51 uh, respondents to do this, they're actually psychology students at Kiel. Um, predominantly, everybody tries to sort via genre to begin with. Um, I was 90% 90, 90 of people try and do that. Then gender of the artist, then speed of song, but actually, then it becomes far more personal. And the interesting thing, even with genre of music, even though everybody tried to sort it via that particular attribute, nobody agreed on the names of the genre, nobody agreed on which songs fitted into which genre. What actually people want was this idea that music is far more personal. There were far more sort of personal things that people were sorting by. So it was uh, songs that make me cry, songs that make me happy, songs that I listen to while studying. The, the weirdest one was songs that I listened to in lectures. <laughs> but they were psychology students, not computer science students. Um, and I found that quite interesting, because again, this is now what Spotify do. And I'm not saying that Spotify read my PhD thesis, but in effect now, the way that we navigate things like Spotify is these automated playlists are very much based on things like activity and very much based on personal stuff, uh, our emotion. So that was card sorting. The next thing I looked at was uh, something called learning analytics. So in every single interaction that a student has with us as a university, well, not every single interaction, but quite a lot of interactions they have with us, data is created. So every single time a student attends, we record that. Every single time a student logs onto the Wi-Fi, that's recorded. Every single time that they look at my lecture slides or videos, that is recorded, and so on. Now, notoriously, HE hasn't been very good at using this data, uh, and this is where learning analytics then fits in. Can we use that data to, to inform us about how our students are doing? And it sounds quite creepy, but the idea being is that we produce a far more personalized and then supportive system. Okay, so we take all of that data, analyze it, and do something interesting with it. Now, most of these analytics systems kind of look like this. Uh, Blackboard is the, the virtual learning environment that we use. And this is, they're very much sort of lecture or staff facing, uh, and they use sort of typical ways of visualizing data, bar charts, uh, et cetera. Uh, and quite often, these sorts of dashboards, this is how they're designed, totally uninspiring, and don't actually answer the questions that I personally would want to ask of them. Now, interestingly, the gap in the market that I saw, there was nobody actually looking at student-facing systems, which I think is far more important and valuable. So actually giving students access to their own data and information so that they know how they're doing as well. And of the systems that are out there, very few of them have ever actually done user-centered design, so I've gone and asked students what they want of this. Very few of them, actually, the articles that are published, uh, explain what that process was, how they visualize the data, and why. So the study that I'm going to talk, you, talk to you about now, this is the first study done in the world, actually, in this area. Because what I'm interested in is this. How can we present student data back to students and lecturers using user-centric queries, so finding out what are the questions that people want to ask of this data, in formats, the formats that they want, and in particular, I'm interested in metaphors. So how can we use metaphor in the same way that we quite often use metaphor in uh, teaching? How can we use metaphor to actually engage students with their data? Um, and this was Gordon's idea, this one. The, the technique that we uh, chose to begin with is something called laddering, and it's called the annoying child. Uh, annoying, the annoying questioning child technique. And it's this thing of going, why? 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 So in an interview, you'll ask a question. Somebody will give you a surface-level answer. Just go, well, why? 
then they'll give you another le- then they'll sort of go up a level, give you another answer. You'll say why. And at some point, they'll reach a point where you actually get to that core value, that sort of core uh, revealing answer, I suppose. So we use what's called a, a pairwise comparison. So we showed them a couple of images. They had to pick one of them. It didn't really matter what they were. It's purely to get people thinking. So when thinking about what motivates you to study, which of these do you prefer and why? This one chose the right one. Looks how they feel. Why? Shows how hard they are trying. Why? No point in spending £9,000 if you're not going to try hard and do well. So that was the core. That was the real motivation behind that first uh, answer. So we did that with students to try and find out what motivates them to study. Then, once we'd done that, we used this card sorting method to try and sort of categorise them uh, into groups. So students, uh, of course, looking at money, that's what a lot of students are here to do, get a job, earn some money at the end. Some uh, forming a professional community, they want to be part of a community uh, in their particular discipline. Um, some students just motivated by fear, fear of failure, fear of disappointing people. Some uh, family, um, some because of a particular career. Some mastery, because they love the subject, they want to be a master uh, of that subject. And interestingly, um, options. Um, we were thinking in this case, particularly from Stoke-on-Trent, uh, students don't want us to hang around in Stoke-on-Trent. They want to get out. They go to university to try and branch out, give themselves more options. So we then got students to create mood boards, so give us ideas uh, of, sort of visual, um, visual metaphor and visual design styles that sort of would appeal to them. And then we gave all of this information to a fantastic design company, and I'll say that because I'm about to say something not nice about them, but it'll end up being nice. So they were a company on the the Science Park. I hope that they're still there. I haven't spoken to them for a while. We gave them all of that information, and they produced this. So this timeline here, this was supposed to sort of represent a student's progress. So the student would log into the system to see how they were doing, and there'd be this squirrel here, because Keel's known for squirrels, so that makes sense. And what would happen is that as they were progressing, this tree would sort of grow. Uh, and they, had, they kept mentioning fractals for some reason. So this tree would somehow grow as the sort of student grew, I suppose, during the module. The squirrel would hop down from the tree every so often and gather nuts of inspiration and go and hang them into the tree as they were being collected. What do you think of that? Charles, Charles doesn't like it. My father in law doesn't like it. Anybody love it? Nobody willing to say. I like trees. I like trees as well. Well, it doesn't really matter whether we liked it, because I can't see anybody here that's a student that would actually interact with this. But what we did was to use that as the basis of six focus groups for 20 students, organised and run by student ambassadors as well. And of course, what students said, and this is where, again, my other lesson of how I learned to stop worrying and love the user, they said, I don't want to be represented by a squirrel, that's stupid. Just represent me as me. So this personified view. And another half of them said, I'm not a child, just put bar charts, because bar charts are professional. And again, it was one of those moments of going, this, on the surface, it's beautiful. This is what the design company are superb. The stuff that they'll produce, I'll show you in a second, is superb. But it's one of those moments where a designer has gone down a path and then we've had to go, no, this is what they said. We're not going down that path. Um, This is just to show you, again, just another method. We use something called a contextual interview where we produced a first version, sat students down in front of it, uh, and then took that feedback, produced a second version. Um, And this is kind of what it looked like. So of all the research, of all the time that we spent doing this, this took the longest. Um, to come up with a privacy policy, data processing, consent, and so on, in order to mount a mind just to time, just to produce that page. Do you think any students read it? No, because none of us read those things. Students would then pick um, what motivates them, so they could pick uh, their motivators. They could then choose how this was going to be um, visualized, this professional view or this personal view. And again, it was this moment where um, Chris Briggs, uh, who was the developer on this, who's now just finishing a PhD um, in the school, fantastic developer, and this is the artwork, and it is beautiful, was creating this. It's basically this design your character, create yourself within this system. 
And I said to him right at the start of the project, way before we'd done this, if we end up creating a version of The Sims, which is a game where you create a version of yourself in a world, then we've failed. But actually, and this proves, if, I'd, if, we'd, have not, if we'd have not done that, then we would have failed, because this is what the students were suggesting to us. So students could create a version of themselves in this system. And then every week, basically, we take their data, do some clever stuff in the background, um, and try and give them scores. So mastery, on the left-hand side there, you've got books. The more masterful you become of the subject, and what we did was it was related to how much of the content that they'd actually viewed that week, they'd get more books. Money was a car, so we had different levels of car. Uh, professional community, you'd sort of get more icons on your phone. Options, uh, this is the highest level thing, it's an airport. So basically you can go and work in another country. And then we give them recommendations about how that it could actually improve for the following week. So each week, so unfortunately this student's going worse and worse, so uh, just a city appears, so they can go to London, mastery's gone down, cars got worse, uh, getting even worse there, connections going down, predicting that they get a third, so that was the, uh, the attainment motivator. They've gone back up a bit this week. They could interact with this and it would explain to them actually how these scores were created and what they actually meant. But at the end of the day, it's just a score out of five, and that's the key thing to remember. Um, it's just a way of visualizing it. So five different types of car for many, five different types of house or family, and fear of failure was quite a weird one to try and do. So what we did was that the characters sort of would get closer to the, to the trap door and the trap door would open, um, which I'm not quite sure. Um, how motivating that was, to be brutally honest. But it's quite difficult to, to visualise uh, and have a metaphor for something that's quite negative. Um, and then there was the other version, so they could just have a, a bar chart if that's what they prefer. They could also compare some of their, their, um, their interaction uh, with the university with their other peers, so they could kind of judge where they were in relation to other people on the module. Um, and importantly, this all worked on a mobile phone, which is a really difficult thing to actually do. Um, but because predominantly we identified that students would use their mobile phone to interact with this, it had to work on mobile. And they'd also get weekly emails as well with updates on their scores, suggestions of what to do and so on. So we tested this out on four undergraduate modules, uh, computer science and geography. 169 students signed up. It's only 48% of the students. So even if you create something like this, you're still not going to get every single student that will sign up for it. Um, some of the evaluation things that we did, um, we did find that students compared to the previous cohort clicked a bit more on the virtual learning environment. Uh, we found that this sort of these two different versions, our second version did show an improvement, so that more students did log on uh, to the second version. We did send out a questionnaire um, asking with, where, whether they thought uh, the system, they could use it as a tool to enable them to improve their performance. Uh, the majority said either yes um, or maybe. Gives a clear idea on what you need to do more of when studying, somewhat held me accountable. And we also did some more of these interviews where we sat students in front of their own visualizations, their own dashboard basically, uh, and got them to actually just express what they were thinking uh, as they were looking at it. Um, and the sorts of things that they were interested in came out of that. Um, and I think interestingly, some of the things they said, so what made students reflect on a weekly regular basis instead of only working hard around assessment time? When they saw things were going down, that then motivated them to actually improve, uh, to work a bit harder. And the idea between human-centered design is this is it. It's just lots and lots of people. And this is why people don't want to do it, because you have to get really involved. You have to get lots and lots of people involved with this kind of thing. But I hope you see, you get some interesting, exciting things out of it, which I think are better than products that are out there. The final thing, which, this is going to be an overview of this project because it's still ongoing. Um, and this is in collaboration with Dr. Charles Pantin uh, down here, um, who for, I'm going to get the year wrong, Charles, is it 30 years? Yeah. So the Bedside clinical guidelines have been going for 30 years, and, and Charles is the, I'm not sure the right phrase, but the inventor, or the, one of the sort of instantiators, or sort of the first people to do this. And, the idea, and this has been done at, at the local hospital here, but now is used uh, in trusts across the UK. The idea behind these guidelines is there are lots of medical guidelines that exist, so probably you may have heard of the NICE guidelines. Um, 
The guidelines that Charles and his colleagues have been producing, though, are to be used at the bedside in the moment. And they are written by doctors for doctors. So it's kind of like they're taking all of that tacit and semi-tacit knowledge that a doctor has and trying to put that down in a way that other doctors, potentially junior doctors, can then understand. Um, this is what it looked like uh, until recently. On the left-hand side there, so it was printed in a book form. It was so popular that they had to be padlocked, I think, to, to tables and things, uh, so they wouldn't go walk about. Um, and then over the past sort of six years, what we've been trying to do is develop, using this user-centered design process, an apt version um, of, of this book, which is also sort of stored as a PDF on the internet. This is what it looks like. So left-hand side, uh, sort of guideline text with warnings, instructions about what to do. There's also sort of flow charts as well, sort of on the top right there, that people would have to follow um, to have some sort of diagnosis, I guess. And then there's also manual calculations that people have to do as well. And this is what I was quite sort of astonished by, actually, that people would, there are certain charts within this, this PDF now, people would print out and then sort of manually draw lines across. Now, of course, as a computer scientist, you go, wow, we could actually do something with that. We can immediately make that better. Um, but what we did was over five, yeah, four or five years, uh, James Mitchell, who now is an assistant professor at uh, Colorado uh, University in the States. We lost him, unfortunately. Uh, basically, again, this is what user-centered design looks like. Lots and lots of methods, lots and lots of time that James put into working with clinicians to try and find out how do we represent this information? How do we take something that's in a book? How do we put that into an app? But how do we make sure that then that app suits how they want to work? So uh, he started with observations. We actually went into the hospital, I think it was about a month, and just watched people, how they use technology, to try and work out, well, how would that fit in with how people uh, work currently? We sent out a survey. I think 146 clinicians filled it in, trying to find out what apps do they currently use. Um, he ran focus groups. Uh, he sort of did this iterative prototyping, so showed people uh, versions of this app, got feedback. Um, and we're at a stage now where we have produced, or James produced, sort of a, a prototype version. This was tested out with 38 uh, medical students. Um, we killed, so we gave them clinical scenarios, so sort of uh, example things, example scenarios that they'd need to, to follow and solve using the app. Uh, he recorded what they were saying, so we asked them to think aloud so we could try and work out what they were thinking. Uh, and he also recorded the screen as well. And sort of the research output from that are these 15 design recommendations now, so that if anybody else is trying to produce a similar app, they have that. But actually now, this is then informing the process that we're going through now of getting clinicians to rewrite something that were originally for a book and then put it actually into an app. And the other great thing about this, of course, is that I think there are about, it's about 30 or 40 calculation tools, different ways, yeah. So I think more than that. So at the moment, a lot of this stuff is manual. Now what there'll be is actually in line, so that when somebody comes to a point where it says, right, and this is where you need to give the drug or whatever, they'll be able to calculate that within the app at that point. They won't have to go to another machine or go out of that onto another app. That will all be built in within the app itself. But again, all driven by working uh, with clinicians. So I hope you get an idea from that that its methods are really important, users are really important, but it's finding the right method uh, and the right people to work with, of course, as well. The thing I want to finish on, though, um, it's kind of related to what Jonathan was talking about. Human-centered design as a concept is becoming quite sort of in again. It's kind of been rebranded several times. So when I started, it was user-centered design, then human-centered design. Now there's this thing called design thinking. Um, the concept itself has been around, as I said, for a very long time. Um, and the idea now is that people are seeing, well, actually, using these techniques can solve lots and lots of other problems around the world. Um, so people looking at things like poverty, gender equality, clean water. Um, I know that... Um, United Nations are using design thinking techniques to look at some of the sustainable development goals. Um, and I know I'm teaching now uh, on one of our global challenge pathways, design thinking to students uh, and looking at how we could look at sustainable development goals. But anyway, key thing is design thinking. People who face those problems every day 
are the ones who hold the key to their answer. And this is just all about this, how I learned to stop worrying and love the user. It's so simple, you don't have to actually come up with a solution yourself. Find out from your target audience what they want. They have the solutions to these problems. And I think the other side of that is this. Human-centered design offers problem solvers of any stripe chance to design with communities, deeply understand the people, etc. And I've, ha I've highlighted that on purpose, problem solvers of any stripe. One of the main problems that we have in computer science is our lack of diversity. One of the main problems that the world has is the lack of diversity at the top of all of these big organizations. So if you look at people like Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, uh, Jeff Bezos, they're all very, very similar. They're all white male, they all went to similar universities, they all have similar stories. That then impacts on the decisions that they make uh, and of course then impacts on us. And that's why it's really important. Um, this is kind of going back to this DALI tool. I put in a group of computer scientists. Anybody notice there's, there are a few weird things about that? One, they're all smiling. Computer scientists, they don't smile in groups like that. We don't get that close to each other. Um, but ignoring that, anybody notice anything about this? Lack of diversity, yeah. So it's interesting, actually, when I did this, because Marco and I always laugh about this when we're trying to find sort of images for the website. A lot of these stock image galleries, are usually predominantly white male, if there is a woman, she's sitting at desk, and sort of the man is sort of pointing over at the screen. It's interesting that actually there are more women in this, but they're all white. Uh, they're all of a similar age. This isn't really what, computer, what a group of computer scientists or I tried data science as well, same kind of problem. This is a problem, not only because of our discipline, we need to be more diverse, but the fact is an AI-generated image is also picking up those biases. It's also picking up those problems. Um, an AI bias occurs because human beings, at the end of the day, uh, choose the data that algorithms use, also decide how the results of those algorithms were applied. And if you don't have diverse teams, if you don't have diverse people, um, sets of people developing these sorts of things, this article says it's easy for unconscious biases to enter machine learning models, but also, it's not about unconscious biases, it's actual biases that people have, real world biases that are out there already within the data that we don't want necessarily in the world. In the world. Um, then, of course, if you have these biases within this data, within these models, then AI systems automate and perpetuate these biased models. And this has, will already, and will have quite severe consequences. So it's already been shown facial recognition systems uh, up to 90% less accurate at recognizing images of black men and women compared to white individuals. Images of white patients are predominantly used to train algorithms to spot melanoma, which could lead to worse outcomes for black people through missed diagnoses. So all of these biases that we already have in the world, they're just going to be parts of these systems, unless we're aware of that and actually start to make sure that we have more diverse people looking at these problems. And I'll finish on this. This is the thing that I'm probably most proud of in my time at Q. In 2019, um, I led a bid for uh, 25 times 10,000 pound scholarships over three years for black female and disabled students to come study on our uh, MSc AI and data science course, um, which, sorry, uh, which is a conversion master's course. So it's, it's supposedly a master's that any student can actually come and do. Um, so we got that 250,000 pounds and we also got some funding to create the course. And I, along with other colleagues and Theo, we created uh, this course uh, during a pandemic and launched it, I think, within sort of five, six months, um, which was hugely stressful, which you acknowledged and it was. Um, but what's great is this. So since 2020, we so far welcomed 129 students. 45% um, were black, 19% had a registered disability, 40% were female, and 41% were from far, not, far non-STEM backgrounds, so non-science backgrounds. Um, now, interesting to compare that. In 2018, only 8% of our MSc students were black, 22% of students were female. I haven't been able to find the data, but I distinctly remember in 2017, I think we had an entire cohort at master's level which was all male. So this is a huge um, change. This year, 49% of our MSc students, uh, MSc students are female, 69% are black. 
Okay. So this does have an impact. And luckily, we've applied for some more funding. Um, and this is sort of the challenge. If you know anybody, we've got now 24 scholarships available just for this September. We've widened out the criterion that people uh, can come under. So it's still predominantly sort of targeted at black, female, and disabled students. Also, students from low socioeconomic backgrounds, strange students, care experience students, gypsy Roma traveler students, uh, refugees. Uh, and also children from military families, veterans, and partners. So if you do know anybody that, well, they may not even realize that they want to do a master's in AI and data science, but please do tell them about this. We have these scholarships ready uh, to give away. And ideally, maybe this is kind of what we'll see then as the future. And I won't have to type the words diverse group with different ages either side. And then hopefully, if we get a load of diverse people to do this and they follow a human-centered design process, maybe we can fix that machine. Please, Trevor. <laughs> um, so that's it. This is the end credits. So this is where I'll get emotional, I'm afraid. <laughs> so thank you to my parents. Uh, so it's weird. Lydia Phil is, is my mum and my stepdad. Uh, thanks to my dad and Joan, Victor and Joan. Uh, thanks to my wife, Hannah, and my son, six-year-old son. He's awake. He's there. <laughs> uh, uh, Charles Pantin, as well as the person behind the bedside clinical guidelines, is also my father-in-law. Uh, so I'd like to thank him for his support, uh, and Sue, uh, his wife. Gordon. Gordon Rugg there at the back. Uh, everything that I put on there is based on, on Gordon's work. Um, and I, I loved working with Gordon. Gordon was the best PhD supervisor in the world. Uh, and he's written a book about it, which is available in all good booksellers. Um, Theo Maria uh, there, as well as colleagues. I've known Theo since 2006, seven. I think you came to Kiel. I've known them since then as colleagues and as friends, and they're also the guide parents of Barnaby as well. Um, Collaborators, uh, Liz, who I've mentioned, who's here, Eva Giraud. I'd like to thank Peter Andras, who was the head of school, because he, I didn't have, I wouldn't have applied to get to be a professor as it wasn't for him. Uh, other colleagues, Sandra Woolley, Nikki Williams, who's here at the back. Uh, we did our PhDs together, uh, and we were also program directors together at the same time. Uh, Steve Linkman, uh, who some of you may have heard of, uh, but he was a big inspiration, actually, on my career. Mark, here's Mark, Mark Turner. We shared an office several times um, over the years, did PhDs at the same time, and also Martin Parker, who some of you may know, who's now at Warwick. And thank you to all colleagues, students, uh, various schools of computer science and mathematics uh, that I've worked at, visited, uh, externally examined, and so on. And I suppose, importantly, thank you uh, to all of the users, uh, past and future. And this is where it is. This is getting difficult. Um, so that's me in the middle. That's uh, my grandparents, Granny and Tom. Um, Tom was, six, I think, six, over six foot. So that's why I'm so tall as well. Uh, but he was a coal miner. Um, so he was a coal miner in Staffordshire, in um, Cannock, in Norton Keynes. And I won't be able to say this, but I said this at our wedding in um, 2013. Uh, this is a tribute to them, basically. Where I am today is partly a tribute to them uh, and their lives, and their lives did mean something. So thank you very much.